Hello everyone and welcome to a new video where we today are going to talk about the PKK and its terror recognition. Is it a terrorist group or not? This video will be divided into three sections. In the first part of the video we're going to talk about the history of the PKK. In the second part of the video we're going to talk about my own personal opinions. And in the third and last part we're going to talk about the PKK terror recognition among other countries and analyze its legitimacy. This will be a very long video so make sure you got some water and some snacks and without further ado let's get into the video. was a year that would change the history of Turkey. It was a year that also would change the fate of the Kurds and Middle East in general. Because this was a year when Turkey joined the NATO alliance. Now the NATO alliance was an alliance between western countries with the aim of guaranteeing the freedom and security of its members through political and military means. In other words, when Turkey signed to become a NATO member, they also was guaranteed a unique friendship and alliance with all of its members. Every enemy of Turkey was now NATO's enemies, at least in theory. In the late 1960s, many left-wing groups in Turkey united. From this movement, a new type of Kurdish nationalism grew. Among the protesting students were Abdullah Öcalan. The demands of the students provoked both the military and Turkish nationalists. Many of the student groups who made their appearances in the late 1960s was forbidden in the 1971 military coup in Turkey. The 1971 military coup in Turkey would change the Turkish-Kurdish relation in a way never seen before. The Turkish state deployed emergency laws in Bakur, Turkish occupied Kurdistan. Kurds were being mass arrested, kidnapped and tortured by the Turkish military. Within the upcoming months, the international community criticized Turkey for the actions taken against minorities after the military coup. In 1978, Abdullah Öcalan and a few colleagues formed the PKK, Kurdistan's Workers' Party. Two years later, the military once again gains control over Turkey in the 1980 military coup. If Kurds thought that the 1971 coup was bad, this became much worse. Several social changes are made by the military to totally erase the Kurdish identity in the country. Among many things, Turkey forbids the Kurdish alphabet, making it impossible for Kurds to name their children with Kurdish names. In the aftermath of the coup, over 1,500 Kurds are killed by the military, while over 100,000 Kurds are imprisoned by the state. The brutality by the Turkish state gives PKK no other options but to intervene through war. Öcalan travels to Rojava, Syrian-occupied Kurdistan. Towards the border between Turkey and Syria, Öcalan and his men are settling, building bases for PKK while placing a foundation of PKK's influence locally. The first PKK attacks against Turkey are made in 1984. In this attack, seven Turkish soldiers and two police officers are killed while three civilians was wounded. PKK gives their demands to Turkey, the total independence of Kurdistan, but Turkey refuses. The time after the first attack in 1984 will be full of clashes. In only a year, the two parts are involved in 70 clashes with over 200 dead. In 1987, Turkey introduced village guard system, a strategy to deal with PKK through other means than direct combat. The Turkish state pays poor Kurdish farmers to act as local spies. In most cases though, the payments are not sent by the Turkish state and years later it has been revealed that Turkey actually threatened Kurdish farmers to either cooperate with the state or have their land and sometimes whole villages burned down. For PKK, the people working with the Turkish state are marked as nothing else but traitors. In 1989, Turgut Özal is elected Turkey's new president. He is partly Kurd and becomes the first president to be open for negotiations with the PKK. 
among many things, Turgut Özal promises to lift the ban of speaking Kurdish in homes, something that was forbidden before. Turgut Özal also announces that he is open for meeting and negotiating with Abdullah Öcalan. On the other hand, Öcalan is now open to agree on having Baku, Turkish occupied Kurdistan, as a self ruling autonomy within Turkey. However, Turgut Özal is murdered through food poisoning before this becomes reality, and the new Turkish state refuses to put any resources in investigating the murder. With the death of Turgut Özal, the negotiations falls apart and Turkey puts in 200,000 fighters in the resuming war against the PKK. Another 10,000 dies on both sides between 1991 and 1992. The Turkish offensive is effective and PKK are pushed away. Knowing that PKK has bases in Rojava, Turkey threatens Syria with war. They demand the Syrian regime to act against PKK in Syria. Having Rojava as a hideout for over 20 years, Öcalan is now forced to flee, but is denied asylum in several countries. Turkey soon catches up to him and arrests Öcalan in Kenya in 1999. He is placed in the Turkish prison island of Imreli, being the only prisoner on the huge island at first, guarded by over 1000 prison guards. In the upcoming trial, Öcalan is accused of being personally responsible for over 30,000 people's death. He is accused of high treason, separatism and murder. Öcalan admits both separatism and murder, but denies high treason, saying that he only intended to correct historical mistakes. During the upcoming years, PKK announced several ceasefires with Turkey. After that, Abdullah Öcalan urged the organization to find a peaceful solution. In 2002, as part of the European Union membership negotiation with Turkey, the European Union put PKK on their terror list. Around the same time, the Turkish party AKP, with Erdogan as leader, wins a lot of votes in the Turkish parliament. Among their votes, many are Kurds from Bakur who sees Öcalan's Islamic friendly politics as something that goes in their favor. Within time, AKP also removes Öcalan's death penalty to lifetime in prison, something that happened as a direct demand from the European Union negotiations. In time, AKP would evolve to a party hated by many Kurds, but still due to its support to Islamic movements supported by others. In prison, Öcalan started to develop an ideology called democratic confederalism. He officially left Marxism in 2005. His new idea was based on democracy, equality and social ecology. In another announcement, he urged the Kurdish people to implement democratic confederalism in all four parts of Kurdistan. In Rojava, the Kurdish movement of PYD have implemented democratic confederalism into the society of Rojava. Later on, in 2006, Öcalan spoke through his lawyer and urged the PKK to completely put down their weapons and only use them if Turkey attacked first. He also demanded his full release from prison, something that was totally ignored by Turkey. In recent years, Öcalan have been more and more isolated with the rest of the world. Rumors have even spread about the actual death of Öcalan, something that Turkey is eventually trying to hold secret from the public in order to prevent a mass riot from the Kurdish people. Alright, so in this part of the video we're gonna talk about my personal opinions. For some reason, the PKK has a negative connotation among the world. But for what reason exactly? It is widely known that Turkey have been using false flag operations several times to make PKK look bad. What is false flag operation, you might ask? Let's search for a definition and take a look. A false flag operation is an act committed with the intent of discusing the actual source of responsibility and pinning blame on another party. Turkey constantly claims that PKK are attacking civilians, that they are performing terror threats within Turkey, and of course, as always, a statement from an official government always weighs more and many people are convinced by it, not least in Turkey where all media is controlled by the state. 
Let's never forget that PKK was formed due to the Turkish treating of the Kurds. Now let's look at the first events of PKK attacks towards Turkey. It was in 15th of August 1984 under the command of the PKK commander Mahsun Korkmaz. The official statement of the attack is that PKK attacked a Turkish military base in Bakur where one gendarmerie soldier was killed alongside six injured soldiers and another three injured civilians. At the same time, the PKK also attacked an open-air gendarmerie facility in Cholemerk, killing two police officers and injuring one police officer and one military. This soon followed up with PKK raids against police station in Shert and another attack in Cholemerk which totally killed three of General Kenan Evren's presidential guards and eight Turkish soldiers. So totally in these starting attacks by the PKK, 18 people within the military died alongside two police officers and three civilians. All attacks was aimed towards military targets like police stations and military bases. This means that even if civilians were killed, the PKK aimed for attacking state personnel only and it is unfortunately so that in war civilians die. It would be a whole other matter if PKK attacked a public mall full of civilians or a beach full of tourists. But in this case they attacked a police station and military bases which means that the civilian casualties can't be blamed on PKK. Between the first attack by the PKK and 1991, around 2,500 people were killed on both sides according to official numbers. However, what these Turkish official numbers doesn't mention is that a huge majority of those killed are Kurdish civilians killed by the Turkish state during that time. For what Turkey did after the constant attacks, by the PKK was to actually answer by attacking Kurdish civilians. They constantly defended their actions by claiming that PKK members were among the civilians or that the civilians all had some kind of connections with the PKK. When Turgut Özal became the president of Turkey, the conflict was more bloody than ever before. The number of killed people had rose to 17,500 by 1992. Still, most of them Kurdish civilians. Turgut Özal's main objective was to solve the conflict between Turkey and PKK and therefore he was open to negotiations and to meet the demands of the PKK, at least halfway. But as mentioned before, Turgut Özal was suspiciously food poisoned. In this article, we can read the following. There had been long rumors Özal, who died of heart failure in 1993, age 65, was murdered by militants of the deep state, a shadowy nationalist strain within the Turkish establishment of the day. He had angered some with his efforts to end the Kurdish conflicts and survived on assassination bid in 1988. Özal was poisoned with four separate substances, the paper reported the sources saying, also naming the toxic metal cadmium and the radioactive elements americium and polonium as substances found in Özal's remains. Here is another article, this time from the Turkish media, which in the end states, Özal died in 1993, age 65 at a time when he was engaged in efforts to end the Kurdish insurgency through dialogue. There have long been rumors that his initiative angered militants of the deep state within the Turkish establishment of the day, and that he may have been poisoned as a result. Now, something that supports the reason for why Özal actually died was the death of the Turkish general loyal to Özal's peace plans with PKK. His name was Esref Bitlis. As general commander of the Turkish Gendarmerie, Bitlis supported the plans of President Turgut Özal to resolve the Kurdish-Turkish conflict by peaceful means. A week before he died, Bitlis met the foreign ministers of Syria, Iran and Iraq to discuss Özal's peace plans. Bitlis then died in a controversial plane crash. So now we have two persons within the high political elite in Turkey, both killed with very close gap between each other and both 
linked to a Kurdish Turkish solution. As soon as Özal was killed and the military took the power again, a military campaign like nothing before started in Turkey, which actually would lead to the capture of the PKK leader Abdullah Öcalan in 1999. From the first ever peace process, it has always been Turkey who have restarted the conflicts with PKK again and thereby themselves destroyed any chance of actual peace being introduced between the two parts. So when looking at it from this perspective, how are PKK the violent part linked to terrorism when Turkey have the much larger number when we talk about killed persons and when they actually killed people from their own side only to restart a conflict with the PKK and only to destroy any hope of peace between the Kurdish and the Turkish people. Moving on, let's talk about what happened after the death of Turgut Özal. Let's read from the book Blood and Belief by Aliza Marcus. On May 19, about a dozen rebels were killed in an attack near Kulp, which was under provincial commander Shemdin Sakik's control. Sakik warned Öcalan that the guerrillas were losing respect. Öcalan, speaking by wireless, told the rebels they were free to retaliate if attacked. Apu sent a message that you could defend yourself, said Dr. Suleiman, at the time Sakik's deputy. Not long afterwards, Sakik decided on a coordinated show of strength and ordered rebel units in Ahmed to cut all the province's main roads. This sort of operation was favored by the rebels because it asserted their authority. They checked identity cards lecture drivers about Kurdish nationalism and shot the luckless state employees they found with a low degree of risk. The Turkish military was not eager to confront PKK rebels on these remote stretches of highway and sometimes sent off-duty soldiers on unmarked buses to reduce the chances they would be identified at any roadblock. The same night that Sakik ordered the main road cut, one of these unmarked buses was on its way from Bingöl to Elazir. Aboard were 35 off-duty unarmed soldiers along with a few civilians. The bus was stopped at a PKK roadblock set up by rebels operating under the command of two battalion commanders. The Turkish soldiers were ordered off the bus, lined up on the side of the highway and shot. So were the four teachers on the bus. Only two soldiers survived. When news broke out a few hours later, even Öcalan was stunned. What we can conclude from this is that the official line of PKK never was to kill any unarmed soldiers or civilians in this incident. This event is often described as the most hurtful attack by Kurdish rebels towards Turkish military. Still, it can be directly connected to PKK's leadership. Another aspect that never is mentioned in Turkish circumstances but which is important to talk about is that this attack in the end was aimed towards the Turkish military which for decades had committed abuse, mass murders and genocides against the Kurds. The four civilians who also were killed and who according to the Turkish state were civilians could they just likely have been military? I mean, what did four teachers do in a military van passing a checkpoint in Kurdistan controlled by the PKK? It all sounds more like an attempt by the Turkish state to create hostility between the Turkish people towards the PKK. Sakik was later captured by the Turkish security forces and he testified during the Ergenekon trials that deep state elements in the Turkish military had sent the soldiers unarmed in the hope that they would be killed as part of the Dugu Khalisma Grubus coup plan. Is it only me or does the Turkish state always attempt to do secret operations to get somewhere with the Kurdish-Turkish conflict and then end up not succeeding as it all becomes publicly known? The murder of Turgut Özal is one thing, the sending of 33 unarmed soldiers is another. Now let's take a look at this statement from the Australian government. They published this four page long paper on the PKK on their website, where they in page 2 have the heading PKK engagement in terrorist activities. 
following a list of different dates and events when the PKK is supposed to have engaged themselves in different attacks against civilian targets. Let's take a deeper look into this. The two most extensive attacks in the list are the August 2006 attack in Marmaris where totally 21 persons were injured and the May 2007 attack in Ankara killing 10 persons. Every article, statement and mentioning of these and all other attacks on that list is mentioned as if PKK was behind it even though PKK completely denies this and another group TAK claims responsibility for the attack. So who are TAK? Basically when Abdullah Öcalan announced his will to seek a peaceful solution with the Turkish state and when Öcalan went from demanding Kurdish independence to accepting Kurdish self-ruling within Turkey there was a group within the PKK who didn't like this. They didn't believe in the peaceful process between the Turkish state and the PKK. Instead, they were for a continuation of the armed conflict between PKK and Turkey. The PKK and Öcalan still believed in the peaceful solution and a solution where Bakur could be self-governing within Turkey. So in August 2004, TAK was created, a group who split from the PKK. It is important to know that this is the official explanation of TAK's foundation. PKK themselves claims that TAK isn't split from PKK at any way. As a matter of fact, PKK claims that TAK is formed by Turkey themselves in order to stage attacks in Turkey and blame them on PKK. No matter what the reality is, what we can conclude is that PKK can't be responsible for another organization's acts. PKK also always have denied their involvement in attacks while TAK confirmed their responsibility. Let's take a look at this interview with CO leader of PKK, Cemil Bayek. How about the civilians who were killed in the TAK attacks in Ankara? We have nothing to do with TAK. But after that there was another attack by the TAK in which civilian died. The important question to ask this is who carried out these attacks? Turkey says that TAK is the same as PKK. PKK has an ideology, a philosophy, a goal, a system it wants to realize. And the TAK has no resemblance with all that. It has no similarities with the PKK. We have criticized TAK in our statements. The state is using TAK to try to show the PKK as a terrorist organization and it remains unclear who is behind it. We have information that Turkey carries out attack in the name of TAK. Information that aims at Turkey are killing civilians, then say that PKK is the same as TAK, thus making PKK responsible, and then uses this against us in the international area. But we as PKK will always take responsibilities for our actions. If we attack and civilians are killed, we make a statement to the people and we apologize for the civilian deaths. This is the kind of organization we are. So I want you to take a look at different parts of this statement. We have criticized TAK in our statements. The state is using TAK to try to show the PKK as a terrorist organization. We have information that Turkey carries out attacks in the name of TAK, aims at killing civilians, then says that PKK is the same as TAK and thus makes PKK responsible. And finally, what I've been trying to show you guys for a long time now, that PKK claims their responsibility when responsible and denies it when they aren't. So TAK took responsibility for both the 2007 attack in Ankara but also the attack in Marmaris. And they take responsibility for almost every attack that the Turkish state puts on PKK. Here is a clear example of when PKK takes the responsibility for an attack. In this case, however, Turkey claimed the victims to be civilians, but PKK said that the bombing targets spies trying to track their position. They came to the guerrilla areas for this purpose. 
Now you have to wonder what does civilians even do at mountainous areas where PKK are operating. Finally, let's take a look at the Serekani or Ceylan Pinar incident from 2015. The Ceylan Pinar incident, which occurred between 22nd of July to 24th of July 2015, saw the killing of two policemen in Ceylan Pinar, Turkey, which led to the resumption of the Kurdish Turkish conflict. The attack was used by the AKP government as a casus belli to end the otherwise largely successful 2013 2015 solution process and resume its war against the Kurdistan's Workers' Party, PKK. As the AKP had failed to win a majority in the June 2015 Turkish general election the month before and soon after the resumption of hostiles announced in November 2015 Turkish snap general election, analysts believe that the Ceylan Pinar killing and return to war will have been used to increase Turkish nationalist fervor and favor the ruling party taking back control over the Turkish parliament. Alright, so let's take a look at the worldwide recognition of PKK starting with those who does not recognize PKK as terrorists and then we will look at those who does recognize PKK as terrorists and why they do that. Starting with Central America where we have 20 countries, none of them are recognizing PKK as a terrorist group. The same thing goes for all 14 countries in South America where none of them have PKK on their terror list. Here big countries as Brazil, Argentine and Peru are included. In the rest of America, Mexico joins the rest of the Central and South American countries with not considering PKK as terrorists. Going to Africa, the world's second largest continent with 54 countries, all of these denies PKK from being terrorists. Here we have countries as South Africa, Congo and Egypt and all of them are denying the status of PKK as terrorists. We now got 89 countries on the list of not mentioning PKK as terrorists. In the Middle East, 15 out of 18 countries stands with the PKK in this debate. Countries as Pakistan, Saudi Arabia and Lebanon. In the rest of Asia, only one country sees PKK as terrorist. The rest, among them India, China and Japan, does not see PKK as terrorists. Countries such as Switzerland, New Zealand joins the other countries too in this debate. Totally 152 countries are not recognizing PKK as terrorists. Now let's go over to the countries that are recognizing the PKK as terrorists. Interesting is that most European countries have PKK on their terror list. A total of 46 countries. Outside of Europe, we can mention seven countries, USA, Canada, Israel, Australia, Turkey, Iran and Kazakhstan. To add on, PKK are also recognized as terrorists by the European Union but not by the United Nations. So let's go through why all of these 50 countries have recognized PKK as terrorists and if their recognition is legitimate. The first countries we're going to talk about are those who are in a direct conflict with Kurdistan or PKK. Here we got Iran and Turkey. They both have a long history of oppression towards the Kurds. While Turkey has been in war with the PKK since 1984, Iran has a direct conflict with both Kurds in general but also the Kurdish group of Pijak with it strongly connected with the PKK and works as a PKK branch in Iranian occupied Kurdistan. So it is understandable that Iran would consider PJAK but also PKK as a terrorist group. The second motive to why countries would put PKK on the terror list is NATO. As mentioned in the beginning of this video, Turkey became a NATO member in 1952. During this time PKK didn't exist but the Kurdish-Turkish conflict did. As Turkey became a NATO member, they signed the mandatory agreement with other NATO members, making Turkey automatically allied with the other countries of NATO and vice versa. In theory, this means that if any other country would attack Turkey, other NATO countries would have the duty to help them. 
PK was formed 26 years after Turkey became a NATO member and after a few years of conflict, Turkey looked for the opportunities to seek world opposition against the PKK, something that they got directly from other NATO countries. There is no coincidence that all NATO countries recognize the PKK as terrorists, even a country as Greece, who reportedly have been aiding PKK with resources and training camps in their historical and in reality hostile relationship with Turkey. Greece, for an example, are forced to support Turkey officially, and all of the 29 NATO members are thereby forced to recognize PKK as terrorists, even if they personally want or doesn't want to do it. So now we got 29 NATO members and two enemy nations explained. Let's take a look at the third motive, which is European Union negotiations. After 9-11 attack in 2001, the European Union started on their own terrorist recognition. Turkey did everything to get PKK in it. Turkey is already a member of Council of Europe and since 1987 they are candidating to become a member of the European Union. However, there is a hard process of negotiations ongoing between the two parts especially during the beginning of the 21st century when several actions were taken from both the European Union and Turkey to make the other part happy. For example, as mentioned before, Turkey lifted the death penalty in the country as a demand from European Union while the European Union in 2002 put PKK on their terror list. With this, several member states within the European Union also took the same road. Statements from Turkish sites which acknowledge that this actually happened are Aylan Çarkin, former member of Turkish Special Anti-Terror Force and responsible for over 1,000 persons' death. In most cases where we accused PKK for various attacks and massacres, in reality we did it. It was all about disinformation, to distort, override or change information in order to mislead the people. One example is the massacre of the village Pinarchik, where several children were murdered by the special force Jitem. However, it was all reported as an attack by PKK. Pictures were spread around on the murdered children in media with Öcalan's picture beside it. People believe that obviously, but they should know that it isn't true. We did it, not PKK. It doesn't make any sense that the European Union would put PKK on their terror list just after the imprisonment of Abdullah Öcalan in 1999 and just after that he called PKK to put down their weapons. Why would that recognition come in a time when peace were developing between PKK and Turkey? It all just reminds me of the same situation between Öcalan and the ex-president Turgut Özal which we mentioned before. Only a few years after that the European Union recognized the PKK as terrorist, the European Court ordered the European Union to remove the PKK from European Union terror list due to the fact that the European Union failed to give a proper justification for listing PKK as terrorist in the first place. However, the European Union officials answered by saying that PKK will remain on the list regardless of the legal decisions. This means that the European Union didn't have any legal justification for the decision in the first place, which gives more room for the fact that the decision only is based on diplomatic relations between the European Union and Turkey. With this we have seven countries explained, since there are seven countries in the European Union that isn't in NATO. One of these countries are Sweden and I'm going to explain Sweden a little bit more because they have a special history when it comes to the PKK terror recognition. In 1984 a former PKK member was murdered in Uppsala, Sweden. Now Turkey once again did everything to blame the murder on PKK. Eventually this murder alongside the murder on Swedish Prime Minister Olof Palme two years later made Sweden put the PKK on their terror list. 
because in three different cases, all between 1984 and 1986, including the murder of Olof Palme, PKK was blamed on all of them who had one thing in common. The Turkish state hinted about the PKK involvement to the Swedish state. There is no known proof that PKK is behind any of these murders and in the case of Olof Palme, the so-called PKK investigation was dropped and several state personnel was fired from their job due to this scandalous investigation. Now looking at the very last motive, we have historical, cultural and religious motives. Now, even though you may only think of Turkey or perhaps Turkmenistan when I say Turkish, there are several more countries out there of Turkish origin. Countries as Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan are all of Turkish ethnic group. Now, Kazakhstan is one of the 50 countries that is recognizing PKK as a terrorist organization. It only makes sense that they are backing their Turkish brothers in this debate. It is also a fact that Turkey has a strong relationship with all countries of Turkish origin. We saw this recently when Turkey backed up Azerbaijan in the recent conflict against Armenia. Another two countries that have PKK on their terror list are Bosnia and Kosovo. Both these countries are Muslim countries and since PKK until 2005 highlighted itself as a Marxist-Leninist organization which doesn't work well with religion, their decision to put the PKK on the terror list sounds like a natural reason. Both countries has also been part of the former Ottoman Empire and there is a large part of these countries who sees Turkey as an Islamic role model for that reason. When Kosovo became independent from Serbia in 2008, Turkey was one of the first countries to recognize them. There is also around 20,000 Turks living in Kosovo and the Turkish language is recognized a regional language in the country. The man who wrote the Turkish national anthem is Mehmet Akif Ersoy, who actually happens to be from Kosovo. All of these points have, without any doubt, effect on the decision of Kosovo to put PKK on the terror list. Furthermore, we have countries like Serbia, Macedonia, who just like Turkey are negotiating with the European Union to become a new member. For sure, we can guess our way into that Turkey have influenced either these countries directly or indirectly through European Union negotiation demands. Cyprus is a country with a Turkish minority but where its Turkish inhabitants have a political influence on the decisions made there. Microstates as San Marino, Andorra, Vatican and Monaco need political and economic relations with Turkey and other countries in Europe in order to survive. There is no doubt that most countries claiming PKK as terrorist has political, economical or social relations with Turkey. It is not even serious to put PKK on the same list as organizations such as ISIS or Al-Qaeda. Not at least when we see that the influence of PKK in other organizations, and I'm talking about the movement in Rojava which helped defeat ISIS and actually saved the whole world. Now, what about the fact that PKK saved thousands of people in Shingal or thousands of people in Kobani? Consider these facts before making your judgment about PKK and don't forget to share this video everywhere so that people actually get to see the reality.